Please bless this word now. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the countless men who died to translate this word so we could have it and actually read and preach from it this morning. Thank you, God, for being faithful, even when we're not. So, God, we come to you. We're listening to you this morning. Bless Brad as he teaches us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Is that okay? That was okay, I guess. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way. And if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 18 today as we continue our study through the book of Genesis entitled Foundations as we explore the foundations of our faith. Genesis chapter 18 is where we'll be. I come to you with a message today. You came to church for who knows what reason, different reasons. But the reason that you are here is because God brought you here. God brought you to this place and he has dispatched me to you today with a message. The most important message that you will ever hear today. It has been said that the eyes are the windows of the soul. That's from Shakespeare. Kind of biblical, depending upon how you look at it. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, you'll recall in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the eyes being the lamp of the body. And if the eye is good, then the whole body is good. Frequently in scripture, it refers to guarding our eyes. 1 John chapter 2 verse 16 talks about the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of one's lifestyle. And that the things that we set our eyes upon often become the things that we desire, the things that we pursue, and ultimately the things that we lust after. That's why scripture tells us in Psalm 119, 37, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. God, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. That's why Job can say in Job 31, 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a young woman? Our eyes are the windows of our souls, but our ears are the windows to our hearts. Much as the things we set our eyes upon become the things that we desire, the things that we pursue, maybe the things that we lust after, the things that we hear inevitably become the things that we believe. The things that we hear become the truths that are lodged in our heart. And think about the power of the spoken word. The power of the spoken word that men have leveraged always to motivate and move entire groups of people, nations, or even individuals. As we see that the things we hear, particularly the things that we hear repetitively, the power of, of repetition. You want to indoctrinate somebody in truth, tell them the same thing over and over and over again. You want to convince somebody of lies, tell them the same lies over and over and over again. That's why you look at a young child, a child brought up and raised, hearing the same things over and over again will inevitably come to believe the things that they hear. And so today I come to you with a message that I'm praying you all would receive as you hear the most important message you've ever heard from Genesis chapter 18. To your call, we're talking about Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. Last week, we talked about the covenant of circumcision or the sign of the covenant uh, given to him in circumcision in Genesis chapter 17. So today we'll pick up in Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse one. And we're going to read this lengthy passage before we break it, break it down. We're not going to do the entire chapter today. We'll be part of it. Where it says, And the Lord appeared to him, speaking of Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. 
So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three sayers of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it saying, I did not laugh and she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Yet again, we have God coming to Abraham and appearing to him having an encounter with him. Now this interaction happens roughly three months after the previous interaction. Uh, previously, God had waited years, decades even, between appearances to Abraham, but here it's about three months. Do the math, he's gonna have the kid in a year, nine, if you do the math, so you got about three months here. He appears to him again. Abraham is sitting by the tent, the door of his tent. He looks up and there's three Characters that he beholds. Now, what we see here is this is the Lord. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ yet again, like we see throughout Scripture. He's got two angelic beings with him, and so Abraham, in the custodies of the day, the, the courtesies of the day, runs to them in hospitality. Hospitality is huge in the Middle East in these days. To, to open up your home to people is a privilege, much as it is in many parts of the Middle East today. They don't think of their homes like we in the West do, as we think of our homes as a fortress of solitude behind whose walls we retreat to take refuge from the world so that we can rest and prepare ourselves for another excursion out into the world. Not so much in this particular culture. Hospitality was highly thought of. And so Abraham, a 99-year-old man, runs to greet them. And then he goes to Sarah and says, quick, make some cakes. He takes the calf, gives it to the young man and says, prepare this. And then he sets the meal before them. This is typical of their culture. And he is honoring them greatly by preparing this meal. They begin to ask questions. Where is your wife? Well, she is listening outside. Is that a sermon in and of itself? I won't go there. I could get in trouble. Amy's listening. She's listening at the tent door. And they say, where is she? Surely I will return next year and she will have a son. She will have a son. This time next year, Sarah's listening and she laughs to herself. I'm worn out. My Lord is old. Shall I have pleasure? She is past menopause. She's in her 80s, maybe even approaching 90. This is completely unreasonable that God would expect this of her. It can't possibly happen. And so she does like most of us would do. She doubts. She laughs. And the Lord obviously hears this. This is an amazing encounter. As I was reading this particular encounter, the one thing, though, that stuck out at me, the one thing that, that jumped out at me was the message. The message. What was it that God was saying to Abraham and to Sarah, but the exact same thing that he had said to them several times previously? And it got me to thinking about the message. The message is an unchanging message. The message is an unchanging message despite the consistent claims of those opponents of the message. I have an atheist relative that likes to engage me frequently and one of the charges he makes is the inconsistency of the message. He likes to point to the proliferation of different Bible translations as if that somehow invalidates the message, ignoring the fact that, well, for other than the 
couple of heretical versions, such as the New World Translation of the Bible, they all say the same thing. What you see is quite the opposite. You see a supernatural consistency in the message. It is an unchanging message. And we see this throughout God's interactions with Abraham. God first comes to Abraham as, as reported by Stephen. As Stephen is preparing to go to his death and he's given this address to the council. And he tells us that God came to Abraham while he was living in Mesopotamia. And he says, go out from the land to a land I will show you. Go out from your relatives. And so Abraham goes. He stops in Haran, modern day Turkey in Genesis chapter 12. God comes to him again after the death of his father. And he makes wonderful promises to him. He makes wonderful promises. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Go out to a land I will show you. Abraham goes. He arrives in Canaan. God appears to him again and says, this is the land. This is the land that I will give to your offspring. And then there's the, the, the account, the incident whereby Abraham and his, his herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen have a conflict. Lot moves to the city of Sodom. And yet again, after that encounter, God comes to Abraham. He pulls him aside and he says, your offspring will be more numerous than the dust of the earth. Look around at this land. This is the land that I will give you. Look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. This is the land that I have promised to you. As God comes to him yet again. Genesis chapter 14, Lot gets, gets uh, caught up in this, this ungodly war between these ungodly kings. And Abraham rescues him. And he's, he has this encounter with Melchizedek, who we decided was at a minimum a type of Christ. But more likely another pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And he blesses him yet again. Genesis chapter 15. God comes to Abraham again. Reiterates the promise. And he gives him a covenant ceremony to, re to restore, or to, to make the promise official. He gives him this covenant ceremony. Genesis chapter 17, God comes to him again. He says the exact same thing. He gives him the promise again. And he gives him the sign of circumcision as a sign that he has set a covenantal people apart for himself. And then Genesis chapter 18 here, he comes to him yet again. And he gives him the promise. He gives him the message. It's the same message every single time. It's recorded up till now. Eight times God appears to Abraham. And every single time he gives him the exact same message. He gives him different aspects of the message. He sharpens the focus of the message. He reveals more and more. But it is the exact same message. And it is a reminder to us that it is an unchanging message. It is an unchanging message that is not subject to the flaws of humanity. Consider that Abraham fell into sin. He even moved and, and abandoned the call of God and went to Egypt. Tried to give his wife to another man in sin. And as soon as he is restored, God reveals the message to him yet again. And it's the exact same message. The message never changes. Yet again, God, he, he falls into sin when he and Hagar or he and Sarah take matters into their own hands and take the servant girl Hagar and give her to Abraham to conceive. They take matters, they abandon the message. But yet again, God appears to him and gives him the exact same message. The message does not change. It is an unchanging message because it's about an unchanging God. It's an unchanging message about an unchanging God. God says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking in the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount about building your house upon the foundation of Christ. And we see that foundation is Christ himself as the cornerstone in that great confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that does not change. The word of God that reveals to us who Jesus is is an unchanging word. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 tells us that the grass withers, but the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. It is an unchanging message about an unchanging God. And what is the core 
of the message. But the gospel message, Romans chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that the gospel message is the power of God for salvation. And what is the gospel message? What is the gospel message at its simplest that statement that is so wonderful that God saves sinners. This is the gospel message, and this is the message, and it is an unchanging message. It does not need adjustment. It does not need updating. It does not need to be modernized. It does not need to be accounted for. It does not need to be mitigated. It does not need to be watered down. It does not need to be massaged. It only needs to be proclaimed. How could it change? Because it is a revelation about an unchanging God who has ordered the steps of his people. From eternity past, how could the message change? It is an unchanging message about an unchanging God. We are the ones who change. We are the ones who change. We are the ones who are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every Wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. That's from Ephesians chapter 4. Is there anything more fickle than the loyalties of man? Is there anything more shifting than the loyalties and affections of people? As we first raise up one sensation after another, as we seek to find satisfaction in things which will never give us the satisfaction only promised in Christ. And so what I find is that the only consistent thing about people is our remarkable inconsistency. It is an unchanging message about an unchanging God. And we see glimpses of this message revealed repeatedly to Abraham. I've been reading the work of St. Augustine of Hippo, Bishop of Hippo, his work called Confessions. Uh, great book, about halfway through, wading through it. One of the things that has struck me about this work, this was written in the 4th century AD, about three, in the 390s. It could have been written today. It could have been written today. Some of the things that Augustine wrestles with, that he's struggling with, that he's encountering, could have been written today. He talks about the proliferation of, of sexual temptation that it's everywhere that he lives in a hyper sexualized culture does that sound familiar to us he talks about the proliferation of lies that seek to undermine the message he even talks about media in essence he talks about actors and plays and how they influence people in an ungodly way does that sound familiar to anyone today he even talks about the sad state of contemporary worship where people do not worship him in spirit and in truth and focus solely upon how they feel. He talks about this in the fourth century and he talks about the message and it's the exact same message. Interestingly enough, the Bible he quotes even is the pre-Jerome Bible before they even had the Vulgate. It's the pre-Jerome Latin Bible. And do you know what? It says the exact same thing because it is an unchanging message about an unchanging God. And so as we see the message march across the globe, uniting cultures and creeds and peoples and nations and destroying boundaries and shattering barriers, it is the same message that fell from the lips of Christ. It's the same message that the apostles proclaimed to their death. It's the same message that caused Peter, Paul, to fall to his knees aside the road on the road to Damascus. It's the same message proclaimed by the church fathers, Augustine, Cyprian, Polycarp, others. It's the same message we hear from the mouths of the reformers, Luther, Calvin, the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon. It's the exact same message. It's the same message we hear from the adult teen challenge proclaimed there that we support our local mission. It's the same message from the mouth of TJ Lindsay in Lima, Peru, our international mission that we support. It's the same message from the mouths of innumerable men and women of faith as they seek to make disciples of their children and utter the exact same message. It's the exact same message from the mouths of countless preachers in iniquity, even today from the mountains of Peru to the jungles of Peru to the slums of Lima, all the way to here and the humble elders of the way. It is an unchanging message about an unchanging God, and I'm so thankful for the message. Amen. 
It is a life-changing message. A life-changing message. Romans 1.16, again, the gospel message is the power of God for salvation. It's an unchanging message. It is a life-changing message, which is why Paul can write in Romans chapter 10, as he does so eloquently, he says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. What we hear inevitably becomes what we believe. And we see this no more poignantly than in the gospel message. It is the gospel message that saves us. God has chosen to save his people through the preaching of his word, through the gospel message. It is the gospel message that draws us into relationship with him. What is the testimony given us of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, 6, quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, when he says that Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham did not earn righteousness. He did not attain righteousness. He was credited with righteousness. And why was that? Because he believed God. God came to him. God spoke to him time and time again. Delivered an unchanging message to him. And he believed it. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's why we can say from Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you hear the gospel message and you believe the gospel message, let the gospel message fall from your mouth. Take hold in your heart and you will be saved. This is the promise of scripture given to us. There's a life changing message, a message that saves us. It's a message that drives us to obedience. As Paul, excuse me, as Abraham heard this message over and over again, what did he do but move in obedience? God said, go to the land I will show you. He went. He went imperfectly, but still he went. God said, go yet again. And still he went imperfectly. He took Lot with him. He wasn't supposed to take Lot, but still he went. God said, go, and he obeyed, which is why the author of Hebrews can affirm the faith of Abraham by saying, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Abraham took his entire household. He believed the message. He took all of the men of his household at the age of 99 and circumcised them. Believe me, I pray that God would continue to place a call upon my own heart, that he would call me to different things and other things. But one thing I'm hoping he never calls me to is to actually have to circumcise somebody. <laughs> if you consider what that actually means, Abraham was faithful. He heard the message and he obeyed. The message of God. Genesis chapter 18. We're confronted with yet another decision of Abraham to obey. God has come to them and said in a sharpened focus that it's going to be next year. All of these promises that I have given to you will come to fulfillment next year in the form of a son. But what Abraham does not, or what God does not say to Abraham is that I'm going to supernaturally conceive a child in you much in the way of Christ and Mary. No, the implication here is at the age of 99 and at the age of 90, Abraham and Sarah would be required to engage, to know one another in the strictest biblical sense of the word, to conceive a child. They're 99, they're 90, and yet they are obedient to this. If you read on, you will see they are obedient to the call of God. It is a life-changing message that draws us into relationship with God. It is a life-changing message that drives us to obedience. It is a life-changing message that crushes our doubts. Who among us would never doubt? Who are those among us that would never look at what God is calling us to do and have doubts? Who among us would never look at the things that God asks of us and say, is there possibly a way that this could be true? 
Back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 as God is giving him the covenant sign of circumcision. It says that Abraham fell on his face and he laughed and he said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Abraham laughed when given the commands of God. Yet the author Paul in Romans chapter 4 can write of Abraham in hope. Listen to what Paul says about Abraham. Remember that Abraham just laughed at God in hope. He believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. He had heard the message that he would be a father of many nations. And he believed God in spite of his doubt. In hope he believed against hope. So shall, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was as good as dead. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's, Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver. He suffered with an unbelief. An episode of unbelief. And again, who among us does not wrestle with doubt and unbelief at some point in time? Particularly when you look at the things that God calls us to do. But he did not waver. He did not allow his unbelief to cause him to waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do all that he had promised. God is able to do all that he had promised. I'm here to remind you of that today. Abraham doubted, but the message crushed his doubt. He did not allow it to cause him to waver. Genesis chapter 18, we see another episode of doubt from Sarah, who is listening from the tent when she hears this word given of God, the message she has doubt. The way of women had ceased to be with her. She was past menopause, past child rearing age. After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, so even then I have pleasure. But yet again, the message crushes her doubt. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says about her. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age. Listen to this part. Since she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She heard the promise of God, saw how unreasonable it was, but she considered and knew him to be a faithful God who accomplishes all that he says and promises. And so she believed God as well. And it doesn't say it, but I'm quite sure that it was credited to her as righteousness, just like it was with Abraham. It is a life changing message. It is an unchanging message. It is the message proclaimed by the mouth of Peter at Pentecost as Peter stood up. As he stood up and proclaimed the word of God. And it says on the day of Pentecost that when they, the thousands of people listening to this message. When they heard the message, they were cut to the heart. The message penetrated to their hearts. And they said, what then must we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. And they are. And 3,000 people are added to the church that day. That is the birth of the church. It is a life changing message that the early apostles Proclaimed despite the, 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 the danger to their personal selves, despite the threats from the authorities as they were ordered not to proclaim the message. In fact, quite the opposite. It says they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. It is the life-changing message that Stephen stood in front of the court stood in front of the high officials and proclaimed the message because it's a life-changing message unto death, willing to go to the grave on behalf of this message. It is the message, again, that drove Paul to his knees aside from the road to Damascus. It is the message that, that Paul took to the Gentiles despite the early opposition of his brothers and sisters in Christ. It is this message that despite the best attempts of the world, of the Roman Empire, to crush the message, the Word of God tells us that the Word of God increased and multiplied. The more they tried to stop the message, the more the message spread. The more they tried to crush the message, the more the message proliferated. And we see that exact same thing happen today. It is a life-changing message. It's an unchanging message. And I was privileged this week to watch the message itself transform a life. I was privileged this very week to see God call a man out of the darkness and into his marvelous light by way of the message. 
It is an unchanging message. It is a life-changing message. There are enemies of the message. Can you imagine the things that Abraham heard from his family and his friends? I'm going to a land that he will show me. Well, where are you going to, Abraham? I don't know. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard, Abraham. How can you go somewhere when you don't even know where you're going? You ought to take your family with you. God has told me to go out from my family. You're going to leave your father and your nephew you here? That's foolish, Abraham. You're going to do it yet again. You're going to go to a place that you don't even know where you're going. How can you possibly think that that is from God? You think that you are going to conceive. You've even changed your name from Abram to Abraham. From exalted father to father of a multitude. You're 99 years old, Abraham. Here, why don't you just take your servant and make him your heir? Why don't you just establish your lineage through your servant? You know that that's, he's here. He's a good man. Are you really going to trust in God that at the age of 99 you're going to conceive a son? Sarah's past menopause. What are you thinking, Abraham? This is not a reasonable thing to think. Can you imagine the things that Abraham must have heard as he was seeking to follow the message of God? There are enemies of the message. Even today, there is a spectrum of the enemies of the message. On one end, you have those who are outright rejecting the message. Outright rejection of the message all the way to the other end where you have a subtle sabotage that occurs of the message. On one end, you have those who are open and obvious children of wrath who hate God, hate the things of God, and they're not shy to tell you about it. Because I was once one of those people, even denying the existence of God, even though creation itself testifies loud and clear that there is a God all the way on the one end of the spectrum. In the middle somewhere you have the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist that John tells us in 1 John chapter 2. They were of us, but they went out from us because they were not of us. And how do we know they were not of us? Because they went out from us. But they were not content to stay out from us. They came back into the church bringing false teachings about secret and destructive heresies about the Lord. Even denying the master who bought them. Possibly trying to lead astray even the elect if they could. Seeking to corrupt that which is pure. Teaching false things about Jesus. That only the most discerning followers of Jesus would ever be even able to tell. And then there are those... And I've become aware of a new group of people on the other end of the spectrum. These are so-called deconstructionists. There are people who define themselves as deconstructionists. And they seek to deconstruct the faith block by block, brick by brick, and take it apart. And they are not seeking to deconstruct the faith in order to build a more solid foundation. No, they are seeking to deconstruct the faith so that they can destroy the faith because they hate the faith. There are external enemies of the message and there are eternal enemies of internal enemies of the message our own doubts our own lusts our own presuppositions that distract us from the things that God tells us this is the message it is a life changing message an unchanging message it is a powerful message this is perhaps my favorite part this is perhaps my favorite part of the message that the message is independent of the deliverer it's the message not the messenger it doesn't matter who is giving the message. My favorite verse in all of the Bibles, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, where Luke, speaking of the early apostles, says of them, they've been brought before the council. And it says, when they saw the council, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated men. And they were astonished. They were astonished at the boldness and actions of these uneducated men. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. These uneducated men. I love the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, when I came to you, brothers, did I not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God, absent lofty speech or wisdom? You see, it doesn't matter how, how eloquent the, the messenger is. It doesn't matter how charismatic he is. It doesn't matter how gifted he is. It doesn't matter the qualities and education that he has. It doesn't matter what he looks like. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the message. Because it is the message that has the power. It is the message that is unchanging. And it is the message that is life changing. I love the testimony of the pastor of my home church, Dr. Larry Robertson. He talks about his father. His father was an unbeliever well into adulthood and he managed the Piggly Wiggly 
in Savannah, Tennessee for his entire life. And even as his son was called into ministry, even as his son was raised up to be a pastor, he existed in unbelief. And then one day, a friend of his, a lifelong friend who was a believer, came to him. And he sat down to him, with him at his desk in the back bay of Piggly Wiggly. And he pulls out a tract. And he fumbles through this tract and he just reads the gospel message from this tract. And at the end, he looks down and he kind of fumbles around and he says, Would you like to be saved? Dr. Larry Robinson's father hears the message and he says, you know what? I've been meaning to do this. And that day his father repents of his sin and is saved despite the fumblings of his friend who presented the message in an imperfect way. But it is the message that has the power. It doesn't matter who's delivering the message. It is the message that has the power. It doesn't matter if they are have a string of, of letters past their name that say Master of Divinity, Doctor of Theology, or what, all the way from that to a simple country preacher delivering the message because it is the message that has the power. It is a life-changing message. It is an unchanging message. It is a powerful message. And this is the message. This is the message that God has created a people, but a people have seen his creation and rejected him. They have looked at all that God has created undeniably and rejected God. Looked at God and said, thank you very much. We will do things our own way. Thank you very much, God. I see all that you've created. I see all that you would give us. I see all that you've done. But we would like to be the captains of our own destiny. We would like to be the captains of our own ships. But that God has sent his son. Sent his son to pour out his own wrath upon for the sake of all who would believe. And this is the great transaction, the great exchange that happens the moment you believe. The moment you believe that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us and our sins are laid upon him. This is the message. This is a message for everyone, for all nations, for all peoples. A global message. A message designed to be transmitted around the globe. And so I ask you today, do you know the message? Have you heard the message? Do you believe the message? Earlier this week when I sat across from this brother, when I was privileged to share the message... I open merely the conversation with this simple line. Do you know the gospel? Do you know the gospel? You would be surprised how many people, even sitting within church pews in America, cannot answer that simple question. Do you know the gospel? And perhaps you're sitting here today and you're saying, I know the gospel. How is this for me? The gospel message could not be more for anyone than you. And here's the reason why. Because we forget the gospel message. Every single time I fall into sin, which happens daily, every single time I drift into darkness or dive into my depravity, it's because I have forgotten the gospel message. I've forgotten the, the price that Christ paid upon the cross for my soul. And so I need to be reminded of the gospel message that I might proclaim the gospel message. What then will you do? Who will you tell? Where will you go? To proclaim this gospel message that has called you and saved you and brought you into a relationship, a saving relationship with God the Father. That is why the gospel message is for believers. And we've got to proclaim the gospel message. Far be it from a day that would come here at this church that we do not proclaim the gospel message. If ever you come to an assembly at the way and you do not hear the gospel message, you have my utmost encouragement to approach somebody in leadership and say there's a problem. I sat in church today. I sat in a study today. I sat in home group today. And I did not hear the gospel message. Because it is the message that is powerful. It is the message that is unchanging. It is the message that is life changing. And I don't want to presume salvation on anyone here today. Do you know the gospel message? Has the gospel message saved you? Why not today? Don't leave this place without the Lord having put something on your heart that you respond in obedience I'm going to pray in just a minute. We're going to sing a song. This is the time where the gospel message falls upon our hearts. 
The word of God does not return void. The word of God demands a response. We can say no. We can neglect. We can ignore what the word says. That is a response. Or perhaps God is calling you to something today to respond to this gospel message. Maybe God is calling you to move in faith. Maybe God is calling you to open your mouth. Maybe God is calling you to respond in some way, even today, that this would not be a routine day, just like any other day. That years from now, you would look back and say that this is the day. That was the day when I responded in faith to the gospel message. Maybe you need to be saved today. Why not today? I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. Let us respond to the gospel message. Lord, we love you.